It's been a pretty long time since part two of the Minor Plan series, but I can say that part four will be coming quickly because it was originally supposed to be combined with part three, but I decided to split it in half because it was just getting too long. So anyway, enjoy. So this is the third part of my Minder Plan series. To understand the context of this video, it's best to watch or rewatch the previous two videos in this series. However, I will quickly summarize what they covered here. In the first video, we looked at Sweden in the 1970s, which had been governed by the Swedish Social Democrats uninterrupted from 1932. And we looked at how they had built a successful post-World War II economic model that put a heavy emphasis on low unemployment, low inflation, with high income equality and high economic growth. However, they had been having some difficulties in holding down inflation and keeping up economic growth. Additionally, while they had extensive income equality, there was quite a disparity in wealth inequality. In the second video, we looked a bit at the development and theory behind the Minder Plan, first by looking at the three aims of what would become the plan. Those three aims essentially were maintaining income equality, decreasing wealth inequality, and increasing democratic control of the economy. Well, there's quite a bit that can be explained about within those three aims. That's essentially what the entirety of part two is about. And as promised, this third part will be focused on the specifics of the plan itself. However, what I can and should say is that ultimately the implication of those three aims led to a plan to do more than simply regulate and tax corporations, but achieve partial and theoretically eventually full worker ownership of industry. The mechanics of that plan is what this video is about. Now, there are a lot of ways I could begin. For example, I could start by explaining what worker ownership is by comparing different basic types of worker ownership. However, that is more befitting of its own video. Instead, I'll start similarly to how I ended the last video by talking about what the Minder plan and its wage earner funds were not intended to do. It was not a plan to make funds for each individual company that workers worked at. It was believed that doing so would hurt solidarity between workers at different companies, i.e. they would compete unnecessarily with each other. It was not a plan to tackle wealth inequality by simply taxing capital at a higher rate. Dealing with general wealth inequality was determined to be outside the scope of the development of the Minder Plan, whose primary focus was dealing with the inequality caused by businesses accumulating unequal wealth through financing their own growth. It was also not a plan to give worker shares that could be individually withdrawn and converted into cash. That would allow the worker share of ownership to be decreased or eliminated, in addition to forcing firms that, to pay out in cash what would be better reinvested in growth. Now the reason I went back into describing what the funds were not intended to be is because each aforementioned description helps break down the explanation of the Meidner plan into three distinct parts. In the first part, I explain the intended structure of these wage earner funds. The second part explains how these funds would have been filled with shares. And the third part explains how the fund was intended to be used. So starting with the structure, let's begin with the left side of this diagram here and how it pertains to the right half of the diagram. The left side of the diagram covers more that's related to the next two sections of my explanation of the minor plan, but we'll come back to that. First, the system has a method which will be explained later in the video, in which the shares of companies with more than 50 employees, no different drafts of the plan had different minimums, would be issued to unions that represent the workers in a given workplace. It's important to make it clear that the plan described here was intended to specifically work within the context of high union density as existed then and now in Sweden. The unions then would pass those shares up to a single centrally administered clearing fund, which then decides how that value represented in those shares would be spent back downward. Importantly, as shown in this chart, these unions are also responsible for electing those that run the clearing fund. A key feature, as emphasized in the previous video, is that this plan was intended to increase democratization in the economy. Therefore, it was decided that even though this clearing fund would receive shares from the unions, it would not be expected to administer the value of the shares and associated dividends and the voting power associated with owning those shares directly, even though its board members would be chosen by unions. This is where the right half of the diagram comes in. During the development of the minor plan, it was understood that it made sense to have intermediate funds that manage the value and dividends of shares at a level above individual workplaces and unions, but below that of the central clearing fund. The main question was whether or not those intermediate funds would have been regional, i.e. split up by location, or sector, split up by industry. Ultimately, it was decided that the final proposal 
would recommend that those mid-level funds would be split up by sector. The reason for this was to summarize that the questions of industrial management would ultimately best be left up to those who knew specifically about that industry, rather than leave things to be managed by largely arbitrary geographic areas. Next, we look at how the board members of these intermediate sector funds would be selected. As shown in the diagram, just as with the clearing fund, the board members would be selected by unions. But unlike the clearing fund, there is another group, labeled in the diagram as the community, which would also be electing board members. This here is where the Meidner plan involves a recognition that the workers that are in workplaces which do not send up shares into the fund system, because, say, they work in a business with fewer than 50 employees, or they work for the government, should also have a say. It was not assumed that political policy should be pursued directly through these funds via these representatives, but that this connection would help coordinate between the funds and the policies of governments. It should also be mentioned that while unions would be choosing the board members operating these sector funds, it would be in two different groups with equal representation. One group would be made out of unions representing workers within that given industrial sector, and the other group representing all those other unions who represent workers within the wage earner fund who were not in that sector. That would help ensure that those sector funds would not be operating in the sectional interest of their industry alone, and this would have been further augmented by ensuring that the board members represented the non-wage earner fund public would get to be a swing vote within those sector funds. It should be noted, however, that the idea was that at the start of these wage earner funds, the primary concern would have been managing the monetary value of the funds themselves, rather than concerning them so much with the operation of the companies that those funds' shares represented. Nonetheless, upon those funds gaining a large enough share in companies, those funds would have to pivot towards how best to manage those companies and, and eventually industries, not simply as workers, but as owners. This includes how to organize the appointments of the directors on the boards of individual companies upon gaining enough shares to practically exercise that right. As shown in the diagram, both the unions within the given company and the sector funds themselves would share responsibility for appointing board members within companies. With the general structure of the funds explained, we move next on to how those funds would grow to own shares in the first place. I had said earlier that the wage earner funds were not intended to tackle wealth inequality in general. It was intended to tackle wealth inequality that came from industrial self-financing, i.e. companies feeding their growth with their own profitability. Here, we'll zoom out of specifically talking about the Miner Plan to say that all successful companies do this, but those companies that have had the most blatantly massive effects on wealth generation do this the most. Perhaps the most famous example is Amazon, a company that for years operated at a loss, precisely so they could reinvest in the continued growth of the company and ultimately the value of its shares. It is by this process that Jeff Bezos, CEO, founder, and single largest, including institutional investors, shareholder of Amazon, is on track to be a trillionaire within the decade at Amazon's current rate of growth. Put most succinctly, the Miner Plan was not so much a plan to stop the mechanism of self-financing that leads to successful companies seeing a spectacular increase in value, but to put that spectacular increase in value into the hands of workers collectively. To end this aside is why I'm more supportive of wealth fund proposals than anti-monopoly proposals but detailing that is for another video. To directly return to the topic at hand, the wage earner funds were intended to harness self-financing on behalf of workers and were not intended to allow those shares to be diluted and turned into cash, but mostly reinvested in continued growth of the fund. So that concludes part three. Part four will cover how the fund was intended to grow, what the value of the fund was intended to be used for, along with a quick series wrap up. Thanks for watching my video. Please like, share, subscribe, and comment.